All right, now we're moving on to the the competition, the Grad Slam. Uh, uh, I was the MC last year for the first uh, system-wide Grad Slam. Uh, it's an honor to return again uh, for the second year. Uh, and again, a thank you to our co-host, LinkedIn and the Bay Area Council. Um, making the mysteries of basic research, and, and we heard from Paul just now about, about the importance of basic research, uh, making the mysteries of that understandable and exciting to the world at large is uh, a real priority for us as we educate the next generation of innovators, creators, scientists, researchers. Uh, I think Grad Slam is designed to play a role in highlighting the the broader multi-dimensional significance of research at UC. So the 10 graduate students um, you are going to hear from today are already champions. They already won their, their campus competition. Um, and they are champions at explaining research in engaging, dynamic, and understandable ways to the public. So they've proven that they know how to talk about research um, to those of us who don't actually conduct research, but we really depend on it and think about it every day we drive across the bridge and the bolts. <laughs> so um, uh, we have a distinguished panel of five judges. Uh, you can read their bios in the program, but right now I'm going to give them each one minute to introduce themselves to you. So we're going to start off the grad slam with a judge slam. Um, and, and we will begin now. Are you ready? OK, we're going to begin uh, with University of California Provost Amy Dorr. One minute. One minute slamming. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. I am the provost of the university. I work in the office of the president. I'm also the executive vice president for academic affairs, which means that I love things like grad slams because it's right in research and knowledge growth and contributions back out with the work that they do. I'll be, uh, I participated last year. I already know how wonderful you will find this, both the people who talk and the view that you get of the very rich work that we do at the university. Thank you. Katie. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Farrick, and I have the privilege of leading our community relations efforts here at LinkedIn. And formerly, I worked in public service for Congresswoman Jackie Speer. I do a number of other uh, public service type roles around the community. And I am a uh, uh, my, to paraphrase E.B. White, I wake up every morning trying to figure out how to make a difference and or how to have a great time. And luckily in this job, I get to do both. So welcome to LinkedIn and thank you for being here for this exciting grant. All right, thank you. Russ. Good morning, everyone. I'm Russ Gould, uh, uh, UC Regent. Uh, it's actually my 12th year as a regent. So we've seen a lot of changes over the last year. And um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here. In my misguided youth, I was director of finance for the state of California, and uh, then went out and ran a business. And I got a chance to see how higher education, the University of California, but all levels of higher education blend in to make California just a marvelous place to live. And so I'm so excited to be here and to see the brand new ideas that are going to be shown. So. Um, I'm, I'm just glad to be part of this. All right, thank you. Mike. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Liu. Um, I'm an investor at SV Angel uh, here in San Francisco, and we're a seed stage venture firm focused on uh, software investments at the seed stage, uh, a lot of which have come out of research um, that have been done by people who are going to be presenting today. So it's really my privilege and honor to be here today. I'm really excited to uh, see what we have. All right, thank you. And Frank. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Frank Somerville, and I anchor the 5, 6, and 10 at Channel 2. And I grew up in the Bay Area. And just a couple of things that you might find interesting, um, I've witnessed two executions at San Quentin. Really something when you drive across the San Rafael Bridge, and poof, there's the prison. And you think, I'm going to watch a guy die tonight. Contrast that with, uh, I flew with the Blue Angels. 
I had uh, two goals. Don't throw up, don't faint. I only achieved one of those goals. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also, I've been a vegetarian since I was 12. Don't like to kill animals. Uh, I train in something called Krav Maga, which is an Israeli martial art. And I always like to tell people something about me. Adoption is very important to me. My younger adopted. And my younger daughter also happens to be black. And so if anybody here afterward has any questions about adoption or you know someone who is interested in adoption, I will talk your ear off because I love adoption. Every night I go into my daughter's room, I look at her and I say, she doesn't look like me, I don't look like her, she's my daughter, I'm her dad. That's what adoption's all about. So thank you very much for having me here. All right. We're delighted to have our, our panel of, of judges. I thought they did the judge slam pretty well. Um, and now we're going to turn to the main event, uh, the grad students themselves, uh, who uh, with three minutes are going to uh, explain to us uh, projects that represent years of serious hard work in, in their fields. Um, um, it's work, but uh, there's no harm in having uh, fun with it as well. So let's make some noise this morning. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage contestant number one, Matthew Savoka from UC Davis. Hope everyone had a nice and filling breakfast like I did this morning and that you're feeling satisfied. But today, I want to describe to you an alternate scenario. One where you had breakfast, but you're still hungry. So you go back and you have another breakfast, but you're still hungry. And you do this again and again. And you're not only hungry now, but you're starving. And this is a situation that's happening in oceans around the world as animals from seabirds to sea turtles, marine fish, even whales are washing up the beaches with their stomach full of plastic trash instead of their food. And despite the pervasiveness and severity of this problem, believe it or not, scientists still do not have a firm understanding for why this happens to begin with. But I believe my research has found an answer, and the answer lies in the nose. Over the open ocean, birds like this albatross don't have very many visual cues to help them locate food. But what they do have are different scent or odor cues. Decades of behavioral and physiological research has shown this. And one type of odor that these animals are very responsive to are stinky sulfur-based compounds. To us, these compounds smell like rotten eggs. But to these animals, they smell delicious. It smells like their next meal. Which is why, when I found this initial result, I was so shocked. Those species of birds that use sulfur compounds to find food are nearly six times more likely to eat plastic than those species of birds that do not use sulfur compounds to find food. And this is a very robust result. Over 50 years worth of data and 20,000 data points went into it. So I knew I had to investigate it further. And that's exactly what I did. Over the last couple of summers, I actually put plastic trash in the ocean at several marine sites off the state of California. But don't worry, I retrieved that trash after about a month and brought it to the Mandavi Institute of Food and Wine Science at UC Davis, where we did state-of-the-art chemical analysis to see what that plastic actually smells like. And lo and behold, every sample of plastic we tested stunk of these sulfur compounds that animals use to find food. So finally, what I wanted to do was test this idea on an animal that we know eats plastic in the wild. And I got to do that last summer in collaboration with the Aquarium of the Bay, right here in San Francisco. The animal we chose to use were northern anchovy, an economically and ecologically critical species found off the coast of California. And the results were remarkable. As you can see from the top two panels of this figure, those fish that were exposed to odors of plastic debris and their food responded in very similar ways, bawling and aggregating around that odor, investigating it. This is indicative of food search behavior, and we did not see it in any of the control trials. And it goes to show that chemical cues associated with plastic likely play a role in why these animals eat it to begin with. And what better day to stand up here before you and tell you about this issue than today, Earth Day and remind you that we all have a responsibility to this planet to keep it sustainable. And I believe our generation of scientists will help solve this issue once and for all. But to solve this issue, we must first understand why it happens to begin with. And that's what my research has done. Thank you. All right. Go ahead and stand. Oh, what, what do you want me to do? All right. 
we're going to do the spontaneous photograph. This is. Uh, <laughs> right, not there's the camera right that there. That guy right there. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Now, right. now, while the judges are adjudicating. Uh, do you have to be near the mic? They told me I have to yeah, be near the mic. Yeah, we have to be near the mic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's thank, a, I, thank I, I was told about it. Thank you. Yeah, we, we follow directions well. <laughs> and. Uh, Next time I have anchovies on pizza, I'm going to be thinking Dang. about your presentation. <laughs> uh, but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you? Where did you grow up? And have you always been interested in science? Yeah. So um, I'm originally from Staten Island, New York, which is the forgotten borough of New York City. But I can tell people that I'm from New York City, so that's pretty cool. I was born in New York City. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. There yeah, you go. Yeah. Uh, we're related. Well. <laughs> But um, yeah, I guess I've always been interested in science. I've always been a really curious person. You know, when I was in elementary school, my teachers would sometimes get annoyed with me. Why are you asking so many questions? And I just say, well, why not ask these questions? You know, and science seemed like a natural route for me. So yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it. So you pursued it all, all the way through. When you're not doing science, what, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you like to do in your spare time? Right, right. So um, I, well, I'm just I'm a pretty normal guy. You know, I like to I hang like out. I'm. Well, I don't know. I mean, I study the way plastic smells. So that's a little weird, but. I didn't want to say anything. Very but. Uh, <laughs> and I'm really glad you retrieved those plastic bags that you that's right. in that's right. the that's marine right. environment. No, yeah. I enjoy things like photography and spending time with uh, my, my friends. And uh, I, I recently, I, I dance, I hang out. It's, it's, you know, it's a good time. Graduate school is a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. You dance? Oh, yeah. Like. <laughs> Judges do not pay attention. No, to they're busy. They're really busy. They're really busy. Okay. Uh, uh, really busy. Uh, 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 all right. And and uh, today is Earth Day. Uh, That's right. I'm, I'm glad you reminded us uh, of that. Uh, where do you see yourself in in five, ten years? I mean, what what's what's your past? What's your future looking like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, obviously, I really enjoy scientific research, especially the question asking aspect of it. But I think this sort of stuff is something that I really passionate about, which is taking that science and translating it to the public. And I think there's that missing link. And, and the public has this large misunderstanding of what science is and why we should fund it. But it's just so critical for the, for the future of our nation to continue to promote science and understand that the public needs to know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's so special about this event. And so I hope that my career can intertwine communication along with, with research and outreach, things like that. Yeah. That, that, yeah. And uh, you say you were raised in Staten Island, but now you're at Davis. How, d how did you make that uh, transition, or what, what, what caused you to go west, young man? Right, right. Well, I've always said I think it's easier to go from the East Coast to the West Coast than from the West Coast to the East Coast, personality-wise, because everyone's you know aggressive and loud and talkative, can you tell, from New York. And and so it's easy to come here. People are so friendly and wonderful and, and warm and stuff. Uh, so for me, it was a really easy transition. And uh, I don't really enjoy winter very much. And California doesn't do winter, so I'm a fan of that. I, I'm with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 totally with you. And, and uh, have you enjoyed your time at UC Davis? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've had a great time. The, the graduate group in ecology there is absolutely wonderful. I have an extremely creative mentor who's helped me with all this work here that I spoke about today, a very supportive network of friends um, that I met in graduate school, one I'm going to be marrying soon. So you know, it's going to be a good time. You're going to marry your friend? Yeah, well she, well, she started out as my friend. And you know now we're going to get married, because you like hanging out so much. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's all great. That's yeah. great. Uh, are, we, are we ready? The green light says go. OK, go. No. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's welcome to the stage contestant number two, Arturo Durazo from UC Merced. Arturo. By a show of hands, how many of you know someone who has battled cancer? The number is no surprise. I myself am a two-year cancer survivor. Prior to cancer, I was the super active person. I was turning on my Vitamix every day, having my green juices. I did not believe that cancer would strike, but it did. For the two million new people who will be diagnosed this year, cancer is frightening and life-threatening. Most will survive, 
but 35% will not. Medicine itself is not enough. Oncologists now tell their survivors, change how you eat and how you exercise. It will improve your chances of long-term survivorship up to 30%. So counterintuitively, survivors do not adhere to these recommendations. Seven out of 100 survivors meet the dietary guidelines. On average, 10, uh, on average survivors exercise 10 minutes a week, 15 times less than the recommended. You might be asking yourself, how is it that someone who's had such a life-threatening experience not change their lifestyle? Self-regulation theory, the theory that guides my research, explains how when overwhelming emotions and faulty thoughts come into play, it will override what we understand and decrease our chances of making those healthy choices. From personal experience, this paradox makes great sense to me. Uh, after my first year of successful treatment, uh, I was now the person who was reaching out for the Cheetos bags and not making it to the gym. Uh, you might ask myself, why did I adopt such an unhealthy behavior? Because my faulty thinking and my emotions overrode my decision making. I no longer cared. Using this insight, we believe we can now harness these health communications. So my foundation of my research is looking at how chronic illness, the concerns about chronic illness, do drive these thoughts and emotions. Therefore, we're not dieting and exercising. So from those findings, I am now focusing on cancer survivors. Uh, looking at all the data that exists since 1950, the few, that, the few studies that exist, 14 to be exact, all these studies express that survivors, because they believe that the cancer will come back and these overwhelming emotions exist, they don't change how they eat and exercise. Currently, I'm adopting some health communications to address these faulty beliefs, address these emotions. So for those 600,000 survivors that are estimated to die, let's prove them wrong. Okay, thank you. That was great. So, um, you need to be near the mic. Um, uh, tell us about yourself. Uh, tell us how you got to Merced and uh, uh, how long you've been there and what's the experience been like for you? Well, I signed on the dotted line in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, my mentor, Linda Cameron, was brought in from New Zealand. Uh, so, that was a big deciding factor uh, mm -hmm. because I love that University of California Merced is looking at health disparities. It's looking at other flagship programs on how to make sure that people who are vulnerable populations don't, are not so affected uh, by issues of, you name it, class, race, ethnicity, Excellent. the whole nine yards. And so when I saw that UC Merced was committed to this, it was just very easy for me to move down, up, to move up from Los Angeles to Merced. And also getting a PhD was a lifelong dream of, dream of mine like the panelists had talked earlier. I, I was one of those inner city kids who was talked to by a professor at UC Irvine, zot, 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 by the way. Yeah. Uh, so, and that planted a seed, although it took years later, it was one of those things like, this is something I wanna do when I grow up. Yeah, yeah. And so, lo and behold, and then now with being affected with cancer, I couldn't have been at a better place at a better time because uh, I was around experts around health psychology. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing is I believe that my field, health psychology, is a really wonderful bridge between medicine and public health. Right, right, yeah. I, in fact, it's a, uh, your presentation, that's a totally uh, new way of thinking about survivorship, and, and you're right, it is counterintuitive. I'm gonna ask you a question uh, I asked uh, Matthew, and, and that is uh, when, you're, when you're not in your field of study and, and working on your dissertation and so forth, uh, what do you like to do with your spare time? No, I actually do dance, by the way. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Just, so, no, no offense, Matt. <laughs> so, so the grads... I actually worked at grads, Arthur Murray. <laughs> the gra you did? You worked at Arthur Murray? Yes, I did. <laughs> I am older. <laughs> well, so I could give you Foxtrot, Roomba, Zumba. <laughs> the whole deal? The whole deal. 
All I'll right. Give you lessons well, right now. The uh, sign up will be after the presentation, <laughs> as will the Grad Slam dance competition. <laughs> right. Yeah, we might be able to do the whole, the, the whole thing. So, um, do you have a specialty in dance, like a you know? Well. The one that I wish I knew how to do is salsa. That one's hard. Uh, yeah. But I think my specialty is a lot like the cumbia and a lot of that more Mexican-based uh, kind of in between cumbia and banda and. Uh, oh, I love I love the music actually. That yeah, yeah. That dancing. I yeah. wish I could. I had the strength to throw people up. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen those videos. <laughs> They're, I've, I've always salivated. I was like, wow, I wish you, I could do you that. You salivated about um, throwing people in the air. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we have a very well-rounded group of students <laughs> in the Grass Slam. So uh, uh, let us, uh, I see the green for go. The judges are done. Thank you for your Thank participation. You. Thank and you. Thank you, everybody. Our next contestant, contestant number three, Shannon Smith-Bernadine from UC San Francisco. UCSF is in the house. Emergency department overcrowding is a significant concern across the United States. Every year in this country of 320 million people, there are over 136 million emergency department visits. And every year, this number of emergency department visits, or ED visits, increases, while the number of available beds actually drops, increasing wait times, increasing the risk for disability and death. My health services research investigates a reality that directly impacts emergency department overcrowding the care for alcohol intoxication. Did you know that up to 40% of people in the emergency department are intoxicated on alcohol? For those with only alcohol intoxication and no other medical need, this costs, a, this costs the healthcare system over $900 million annually. And for those with only alcohol intoxication, they don't need the costly, comprehensive services found in an emergency department. In response to this, many cities and counties have created an ingenious, rather simple service to more appropriately care for those intoxicated, sobering centers. So what is a sobering center? It's like the urgent care for alcohol. Clients are provided a bed to rest in, vital sign monitoring, food, electrolytes, and are given what emergency departments just do not have enough of, time. There are over 20 sobering programs across this country and dozens more cities and counties looking to open sobering centers Yet there's absolutely no research on the safety or cost efficiency of these services. My research investigates the San Francisco Sobering Center, a nurse-led program initiated in 2003 through the collaboration of over 50 local stakeholders. In the eight years of analysis, there are over 30,000 encounters at the Sobering Center. Individuals brought in by ambulances, the police department, outreach workers, and directly from emergency departments. Importantly, over 11,000 of these encounters were brought in by ambulance, directly impacting ED overcrowding. And for those brought in, a vast majority were able to sober safely without any additional intervention, while less than 4% had a medical or psychiatric emergency requiring a higher level of care. The cost savings for this service is significant. Looking only at those brought in by ambulance, the Sobering Center was able to save the city over three and a half million dollars. This was due to the cost of the Sobering Center being less than half that at the emergency department. Alcohol intoxication is not going away anytime soon. My first of its kind research has been able to show that Sobering Centers can be a safe, lower cost alternative to the emergency department. And importantly, I'm investigating the populations of individuals who utilize any service for public intoxication to more appropriately influence health and emergency service policy across this country. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Uh, we'll have a little discussion. I'm told we need to be closer uh, to the mm -hmm. mic. And uh, uh, thank you for that, for that presentation okay. on, uh, again, uh, new ideas, new areas. Uh, that I think many of us have never thought about. But uh, Shannon, uh, tell us about your journey. How did you get to UCSF? I, I started in a small town in Maine, 
Hi, Mom. Hopefully she's watching right now. Um, and I basically ended up in California, a one-way plane ticket out of, uh, once I got out of college, and decided to move to San Francisco when I got my nursing degree. And then partway through nursing in the Department of Public Health in San Francisco, I just saw so much, so many people that needed additional work, and a lot of the problems are systemic, and health policy in general is just kind of the way to answer a lot of those questions. And UCSF has a health policy program directly, directed at nurses, mm -hmm. and it was the perfect fit. And here you are, and, and, here and, I am. and no more Maine winters? No. <laughs> The rainy season's good enough. Season's good. <laughs> that so, was enough. Uh, 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 as you can tell, I, I, I love introducing our students to, in terms mm -hmm. of their greater interests. Uh, when you're not focused on health policy and, and health care delivery, what do you mm -hmm. like to do in your spare time? Um, and especially when I have more time when I'm done, uh, I love scuba diving and hiking, lots of outdoors activities. I like yeah. to kind of get out. I was a skydiver at one point, but once I became a nurse and I sprained an ankle, I decided that that was enough skydiving for me. You, you, you mean you went, you went skydiving more than once? 118. You went, uh, 118? <laughs> wow. I, own, I own my own parachute, <laughs> so. I, well, clearly it works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that's one of the scarier things is actually ra wrapping up your own parachute, packing your own chute, and then jumping out of a plane, yeah. hoping that you really did a good job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have to, what got you interested in jumping out of a plane on purpose? I kind of always wanted to do it, but I have to admit it was, um, my first dive was two weeks after September 11th. And it was one of those things that I saw so many people get impacted so dramatically with something outside their control that, I don't know, I just felt like I needed to do something crazy that was a little bit inside my control. And, and then I just fell in love with it and just kept going for the next two and a half years or Were so. Were you ever an instructor in skydiving? I was never an instructor, not that good. Yeah, no. yeah. Did you yeah. ever have the urge to push somebody else out of there? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I liked freaking people out. Whenever I traveled to go skydiving, I always brought my parachute as my carry-on. So I'd be like <laughs> on Virgin America with my own parachute and yeah, yeah. all the people around me would freak out just a tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> like, I would. Yeah. <laughs> so you, so, uh, skydiving and scuba, did you say? Yes. So you kind of have above. the above and below? Yeah. Um, and, and tell us about the scuba interest. Are you still a scuba? Uh, I, I, yes, I'm still doing that. Um, I just, I love the ocean. I love fish. Any, I'm, anything around the water, I, it just calms me down and it makes me, makes me really happy. I love fish. I love turtles. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so. Yeah. And, and maybe you can um, talk with Matthew about the ones that um, are Eating. smelling sulfur. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, it's been yeah, yeah, about the about the environment there. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find living in? Do you live in San Francisco? I just moved to Oakland, uh, oh. but yes, I live. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now East Bay. Where, whereabouts in? I live in Oakland. So where, no. where do you live? Uh, North Oakland, right behind the ashram that's there to San Pablo and Fifty Fifth. I know exactly where that is. And um, welcome to the East Bay. Thank you. Welcome to San Francisco. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Now that mass would be a constant forcing function on the orbit of our moon, trying to kick it out of Earth orbit, even out of the solar system. Think of Mars in that case as being like that bully in middle school that's trying to kick you off the playground. That's pretty much what's happening at Kepler-32, except we have five playground bullies, and they're fighting each other for dominance. To make things even more high schoolish, um, we the the bullies have resonance. The or the planets have resonances between them, which are the bullies kind of working together, two or even three working to dominate the playground. So this creates essentially gravitational chaos. What I'm trying to do by modeling all of this is figure out if a moon can somehow exist in the midst of all this, and if so, under what circumstances. The reason that's important is because we're easily 50 to 100 years away from telescopes strong enough to actually look up there and tell us if there are moons. Now my research finds that yes, moons can exist even in such cramped systems. However, in doing so, I made a really interesting discovery. Moons can actually dynamically hop between planets. Imagine if we could trade our moon for Titan or Europa, just do a swap every couple of hundred years. <laughs> that's actually possible if you're the third rock from the Kepler-32 sun. <laughs> Thank you to those of you that got that reference. <laughs> the final thrust of my research is to figure out what is the maximum mass that one of these moons could be? That's going to tell us what they look like long before we ever image them with telescopes. Are they small asteroidal moons like at Mars? Are they bigger moons like our own or just dust rings like at Saturn? That's what I'm working to figure out. So I'd like to leave you with this thought. The next time you look up in the sky, think to yourself, it's a cramped universe up there. We found that cramped systems like Kepler-32 are actually more common than our sparse solar system. So maybe, just maybe, figuring these systems out could give us a clue about why we are so special. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, Michael, uh, you were talking about uh, all the bullies uh, fighting in cramped space with their mass. And I, I, I didn't know whether you were talking about the solar system or the presidential primary. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just my editorial comment. That is, mul <laughs> that would be multidisciplinary Multi right there. That's kind of the multidisciplinary approach to astronomy. Um, uh, do you dance? I do not dance, no, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Would uh, you, you know, like to? Apparently, if lessons are being offered. <laughs> but I, I was actually, I have something in common with Shannon that I just discovered. So I am also a skydiver, but I am an instructor. So. Oh, very good, very good. Got to talk to her later. So uh, with, within, within the space of four contestants, we have a dance instructor, two, 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 dance, two skydivers. This is a <laughs> remarkable group of students, I, I, I must say. Yeah, so tell us about your journey. How did you end up at Santa Cruz? Uh, well, OK, so I worked for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they said they offered me the opportunity to get a PhD. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I started off as an aerospace engineer. You know, uh, I, I've always been interested in space. I thought aerospace engineering was where I wanted to be. I did that for a long time, and it was really fascinating. But what I, what I, what I learned is that in the back of the engineer's ears are the scientists whispering, here's what we want. Uh -huh, here's uh -huh. what you need to build. The science whisperers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I decided I wanted to be one of those people. And you wanted to pr pursue that uh, yourself with, with all of the research that that, that that entails. Have you always been interested in um, uh, uh, planets and stars? I mean, uh, you know, what, what got you interested? I have always been interested. Uh, I think... So I grew up in, in Los Angeles, and mm -hmm. uh, you know this is like this is the '90s before today you can see stars, but back in my day, uh, <laughs> it was yeah, all smog. One of, so one of time, our earlier panelists would say you would you're close to retirement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair point. Uh, but but no, so every time I look up and I would see a star, I would watch it for a while and it would turn out to just be a plane on approach to LAX. Right. Uh, so right. just from there, I don't know, I was just always interested in stars and space. Mm -hmm. And so it, it grew from there. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Florida, which I could see the night sky again. Right. Uh, but that's when I went where I went to engineering school. Right. And then I joined the Air Force and I got to work in space. And it's just it's continued to fascinate me. Right. Ever since. And, and, and prompted your 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 research. Do you have a favorite movie about space? Yes, I do. Uh, Star Wars. Uh, no, 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 no. But, but there's a scientific reason why. It's not just the cool costumes. 
Uh, no, because so Star Wars, I think, uh, inspired a generation. Uh, my dad knew absolutely nothing about space, couldn't have cared less, watched Star Wars, and was like, ah, oh, yeah. OK, yeah. well, cool. Yeah. So I mean, it has the, my point is that it has the power to, to reach out and inspire new people. So I, I love Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, the first one or all of them? The f <laughs> four, five, and six, and the new one. The new one, yeah. The, it's not the bad. New one. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to uh, the next iteration of the Star Wars uh, chronology. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, now, uh, please welcome to the stage contestant number five, Peter Byerly from UC Riverside. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter, and I work with electronics. So there's this concept in electronics called processing power, which is basically how quickly can your electronic device go through a series of lines of code to run the software that you want it to run, essentially to do the cool things that you want it to do every day. Now, if you look throughout recent history, in 1985, there was something called the Cray 2 supercomputer. This was the fastest computer on Earth at the time. It was $32 million and about the size of a washing machine. Fast forward to 2011, and you have the iPhone 4. This was $200 with contract and fits in the palm of your hand. Now, the thing I want you to take away from this is that these two things actually have the same processing power, meaning they have the ability to do these same things. So as the size of our electronic devices has gone down to the same amount of power, the cost has gone down tremendously as well. Now, this trend would continue. However, there's a major problem that the general public is kind of unaware of which is that 90% of the individual components in your electronic devices are made out of the element silicon. However, if you try to get silicon down below about 10 nanometers, your device actually won't work. And there's some very complex solid state physics behind why this is true that I don't have time to go into right now. Um, but if you look at companies like IBM or Intel, they're actually moving away from using the element silicon to want to use new materials instead. So in my lab, we're a little bit ahead of the game, and we use new materials that are 2D, essentially flat, like graphene, to build real working devices that are versatile and flexible for the next coming age of electronics. These materials are about one nanometer in height, a tenth of what silicon could ever be. They have better electrical performance and will eventually be cheaper than the silicon counterpart. As an analogy, imagine you're running a business and you need 10 people to do the same job. Uh, these guys are generally unproductive, unhappy people. Uh, that's your silicon-based model. Uh, <laughs> instead, now you only need one employee to do that same job. He's 10 times as productive and actually wants to be paid less for some reason. <laughs> that's your graphene-based model. So you can see the difference here is very significant. We actually have to get over this 10 nanometer barrier if we want to keep making the things that we care about better, whether it's more efficient solar panels and renewable energy, better technology for helping the third world, the next age of space exploration, or even new biomedical devices like this one on the bottom right made out of graphene that actually monitors your blood sugar in real time, potentially protecting the lives of the 400 million people across the world that have, have diabetes, more than the entire population of the United States. So as Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX and Tesla Motors says, if something is important enough, you do it. And hopefully today I've convinced you that shifting to these mater new materials is important enough for you to support. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Come on over here by the by the microphone, and I will grill you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but okay. uh, tell us, how did you get to to Riverside? What's your journey? Right. So I kind of, I mean, yeah, my path is a little bit nonlinear, but mostly academic. Uh, in undergrad, I actually went to the University at Buffalo, and I went for environmental engineering, and I actually worked with algae and like eutrophic lakes and hazardous waste management. But I kind of got sick of actually cleaning up other people's messes, to be honest. And I wanted to get, you know, there's nothing wrong with environmental engineering, of course. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to work more with renewable energy and get a focus in that. So they kind of advised me to apply for a combined program of mm -hmm. chemical and environmental. Mm -hmm. And uh, UCR has one. So I decided to apply for UCR and uh, got in. 
and now I work in nanotechnology. Oh, that's, so. all, that's, that's great. And so yeah. uh, you come to California from Buffalo. We have someone from Maine. We have Staten Island. Um, <laughs> I'm getting a trend here. Yeah, right. Uh, speaking exactly. of trends, do you dance? No, I'm not going to pretend that I do. You don't? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 all right. <laughs> and what do you like to do when you're not uh, experimenting with new materials? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm kind of all over the place, I guess. I uh, have a certification in sailing, actually. Um, I uh, hike a lot. Uh, I'm also the sustainability liaison for a graduate student association. So I help the school make the school more sustainable. Um, yeah, and I just go see movies and try to be a normal person sometimes. So. <laughs> you try to be normal sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> and, we, we try. And, and yeah, are you still sailing? Do you still have a chance? Uh, not out here, just because the hobby became so expensive. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Well, and yeah, and right. Uh, Riverside. You know, Riverside is interesting to me because I've never actually seen a river there. Um, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I don't know where that name came from. And, right. the, and, and the team name are the Highlanders. <laughs> Uh, and I've never actually seen anyone wear a kilt there. Yep. So uh, yeah. I just wonder where all, where all of that came from. Yeah, I actually, you know, I saw Jerry Seinfeld actually in Riverside at the Fox Theater. Mm -hmm. And he made the joke, uh, one of the lamest jokes I've ever heard. He said that, he said, sorry, Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's like, uh, he said, oh, well, you know, now I'm in Riverside, the place where the river is on the side. <laughs> and like everyone laughed, and I was just like, "That's just because it's Jerry Seinfeld, you know." Yeah, I mean, right, right. like that's you feel like there are things you have to do, like, right? Like laugh at, <laughs> yeah, uh, laugh at lame Jerry Seinfeld jokes. Yeah, right, 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 right. right. So. What's your favorite movie? Oh, uh, my favorite movie, um, probably uh, "It's a Beautiful Life," probably. Yeah, uh, Roberto Benigni. Yeah, that's yeah. a great movie. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, has everybody seen that movie, by the way? Yeah, you should. That's a that's a. Uh, yeah. If you haven't, you should, and uh, for a lot of different reasons. So um, we wish you all the best, uh, and, and hopefully when you go back to Riverside, you can find a river. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Contestant number six, please welcome to the stage Gary Lee from UCLA. To send humans to Mars, we need a revolutionary rocket technology. This is the Saturn V rocket that launched astronauts to the moon. It is the largest rocket ever built, larger than even the Statue of Liberty. This rocket requires an enormous amount of fuel in order to launch this relatively tiny spacecraft into orbit. And from there, it requires even more fuel to get this spacecraft to the moon. As you can see, Traditional rocket technology is not very fuel efficient. So how do we get to Mars, which is 200 times further away than the moon? The answer is an ultra fuel efficient technology called electric thrusters, or plasma rockets. By replacing the old rocket technology on the spacecraft with a modern plasma rocket, this spacecraft can get to the moon with one tenth this tank of fuel. Or seen another way, this tank of fuel can get you to Mars. So why haven't we gone to Mars yet? Well, this thruster must operate for many years for a Mars mission. Imagine what would happen if you left your car running for a few years. It would break, and so will your plasma thruster if you run it long enough. So what's the solution? Make sure it doesn't break. <laughs> <laughs> to do this, we have to understand how a plasma thruster works. The thruster creates a plasma, which is a soup of positive particles called ions and negative particles called electrons. These ions are shot out the back of the thruster, pushing your spacecraft forward. Simple enough, right? But what happens when this plasma gets close to the walls of the thruster? When an ion hits the wall, a piece breaks off. And if enough ions hit the wall, eventually a wall will completely break, potentially causing your thruster to explode. But what if there was an effect where the pieces that break off turn around and go back to the wall, repairing itself? Could something like this actually happen? Turns out, yes. This effect, called plasma redeposition, can magically repair the walls of your thruster, making it unbreakable. For my research, I create a plasma and smash it against different types of advanced 
thruster wall materials in order to maximize this plasma redeposition effect. So far, I have found that I can double the lifetime of current thruster materials. That can make the difference between getting to Mars and getting stuck halfway. <laughs> My end goal is to design a thruster that can last 10 times as long, making it effectively immortal. Such a thruster would solve the fuel inefficiency of traditional rockets and enable us to travel to Mars. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary, did you actually see the movie The Martian? I, <laughs> I did. I watched it in full IMAX 3D. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. You saw it in I Too close. 3D? Yeah? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. So, do you dance? I do not dance, unfortunately. Okay, okay. okay. But, but uh, we'll go back to uh, The Martian. Uh, did you think it was realistic? Yeah, so that's the great thing about the Martian. So they actually worked with scientists to actually get everything to be realistic. Uh -huh. Like the thruster that they used on that spacecraft is pretty much the thruster that disappeared on this slide. But <laughs> right. they use real technology that NASA will be using within the next 20 years. So I thought that was the most amazing thing. Yeah. And some of the math might have been slightly off because people in um, academia, for some reason, they love criticizing scientific movies. Like Interstellar, The Martian, Gravity. Every time something is wrong, my professor will be like, well, that was rubbish. So, right, right, <laughs> right, right. So, so they don't view them as a uh, artistically; they view them as a scientific uh, demonstration. It just happens naturally. Like when I watch it, I have this urge to say, "Like, is this calculation right?" But I repress it because I want to enjoy the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so you're repressing your inner math uh, de design. I don't let my inner grad student out during movies; only in the lab. Oh, that's <laughs> good to know. Um, <laughs> Uh, tell us about uh, how you got to UCLA. What's your journey? Okay, so there was actually quite a long journey. It started in high school when I did these science competitions relating to astronomy. So I got really interested in space. And then I actually ended up going to UC Berkeley. Go Bears! Yeah. <laughs> oh, go Bruins too, because I go there now. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I had a great time at UC Berkeley. I studied astrophysics. So instead, like, like Michael here, instead of going from aerospace to astrophysics, I went from astrophysics to aerospace. OK. There were like opposites. Dif different but, journeys. Yeah, yeah, different journeys. Yeah, but it's yeah. a very similar adventure, because uh -huh. we study the same things. We study space, right? So I realized that, again, the astrophysicists are the ones that are the science whispers, the ones that yeah. tell people what to do. Yeah. I, I don't mind being told what to do a little bit, so I went to become uh, an engineer. <laughs> it's not a, that bad a thing, being told what to do, especially if you're doing something really interesting, uh -huh. like developing rocket technology. Ah, there you go. Yeah, so and I thought that was a good compromise. Yeah, there, there, there it is. What do you do in your spare time when you're not engineering? Spare time. I haven't heard that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> That's a concept. You, 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 sometimes you have it as you approach your retirement age. <laughs> Right, but I do have some spare time. So something I got into really recently was snowboarding. So in Southern California, it's really big to go to Mammoth and Big Bear and go snowboarding. And I started, I think, two years ago, and I've gone 10 times this year. Yeah. So it's amazing. And I decided to go a step further and get a GoPro, because for some reason, a GoPro makes you think you're good at something. Right. <laughs> they so build you, that into the software, yeah. yeah. So you have this pressure to do something cool. But Something cool could also be something stupid. Right. So I'm still like a beginner intermediate snowboarder. So I went to the Mammoth like two weeks ago. Right. And I brought also a selfie stick. So that's a new invention this decade that I'm kind of embarrassed to reveal. But kind of an interesting trend. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but you take the selfie stick, you put a GoPro on it, and you try to do cool things. Yeah. So I tried to go on a jump before I warmed up. Right. Right after I landed, I kind of like totally lost balance. I think I'm blaming on the GoPro. Right. And then I fell backwards and I broke my helmet. Oh my gosh, yeah. oh my gosh. But for, un, like, fortunately, I still have my memory of research in plasma rockets, so <laughs> I'm going to finish my PhD. There, there you go. And <laughs> you've now just uh, learned another scientific fact, that gravity, it's everywhere. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, uh, contestant number seven, please welcome to the stage, uh, Kelsey Sakimoto from UC Berkeley. If you ever have the chance to go back in time and change history, don't worry about whatever might happen in the upcoming election. There are much bigger fish to fry. Go back three billion years to the biggest mistake in evolutionary history possible. Three billion years ago, chlorophyll, the light absorbing molecule in plants that powered photosynthesis, popped into existence and from there, all of our troubles stemmed. While the rate at which plants photosynthesize food and fuels from carbon dioxide and sunlight has sufficed for the last three billion years, within the last 100 years, we become acutely aware that plants struggle to fuel our exponentially growing population. And chlorophyll's inability to absorb a lot of sunlight is largely to blame. At best, chlorophyll only absorbs 12% of the sun's energy. And in actuality, plants generally muster efficiencies in the range of less than 1%. Obviously, this is no longer good enough. In contrast, modern solar days, solar panels, now average efficiencies in the range of 15 to 20 percent, although they do remain fairly expensive to produce. If you have the chance to go back in time and change history, fix chlorophyll. <laughs> but barring that magical ability, you may turn to the amalgamation of chemistry and biology that is my research. Over the past few years, I developed an alternative, better version of photosynthesis called artificial photosynthesis. Rather than rely on inefficient chlorophyll to harvest sunlight, I've taught bacteria how to grow and cover their bodies with tiny semiconductor nanocrystals, which are much more efficient than chlorophyll and can be grown at a fraction of the cost of manufacturing conventional solar panels. Once covered with these essentially tiny solar panels, these bacteria are able to grow and photosynthesize food fuels, pharmaceuticals, and plastics, all utilizing solar energy. These bacteria already outperform natural photosynthesis. And as I teach them to grow different types of solar panels, these bacteria's efficiencies are only expected to go higher. These cyborg bacteria, this combination of chemistry and biology, living and non-living, serves as the first step in a revised alternative and arguably better evolutionary history one in which we are not limited by chlorophyll's inefficiencies, and one that allows us to grow and evolve for many generations to come. With the power to wield both chemistry and biology in tandem to redress historical and evolutionary missteps, the question now becomes, what do we fix next? Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you. All right. I love that theory of uh, fixing evolution. And uh, uh, there's a lot of evolution I'd like to change, but. Uh, <laughs> well, luckily, we're always evolving. There's always tomorrow. You can fix it later. We're always evolving. Yeah. That's good to know. Yes. Um, Kelsey, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey and uh, journey to Berkeley. Uh, so my interest in chemistry, uh, as for many people, stem from childhood. Uh, and as a child, I spent a lot of time by myself playing with Legos, mm -hmm. as many scientists do. Um, <laughs> and that, that, that system of this modular approach where you have rules and building blocks to make more complicated structures is what chemistry is about. And as I grew older and decided to go to college, it seemed more appropriate for an adult to be a chemist than a professional Lego player. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a decision that many people approved of. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Do you still play with Legos? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, yeah, but now, see, now it's a teaching tool. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that explains it. Yeah. Um, what, what is the most complicated structure you've ever constructed from a Lego? I didn't really like building complicated structures or large things. Uh, the nice thing about sort of chemistry work is everything is very, very small. They're very intricate packages of very complicated working parts, like mm -hmm. watches and things like this. Mm -hmm. And so the things I generally tend to build were very small, tiny mechanism thing that did something cool, had a little moving lever part, mm -hmm. did some little robotic thing. So yeah. more things like that. Yeah, little robots kind of going. Yeah, 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 yeah. Walking around, doing my bidding. Did you ever make sort of uh, dance? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so you're, you're one of the ones that lo likes to give orders. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. You'd rather give than receive. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think we all do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, did you grow up in the East Bay? Did you grow up in Berkeley? Uh, no. So I'm originally from Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, and that's where I grew up for 18 years. And then I actually went to the East Coast, Connecticut, to uh -huh. Yale for my undergrad. Uh -huh. And as with many, I have now come back to warmer weather, <laughs> hopefully for, for a, a longer duration. That's a, it's, it's, it's a nice draw, is, is it not? It is. It, it is. is a nice draw. And uh, uh, in addition to the Legos, mm -hmm. um, uh, what would you like to do? What do you like to do in your spare time? Uh, the other big category of things I do would be music. Uh, mm -hmm. I've always played different musical instruments. Um, and one of my favorite things to do is to play in the pit orchestras for like musical theater productions and stuff like that, since it is close to the acting, but not actually having to do that dirty business of being an actor. And be <laughs> <laughs> being on, being on stage, what do you play? Uh, a lot of wind instruments like saxophone and clarinet and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. As a pit orchestra person, you have to be able to play maybe four or five different things. Yeah. They won't hire a one, one instrumentalist yeah, to th play one They want thing. you to be flexible. They want you to be flexible. Uh, you got to do it all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and tell us, what are some of the more recent musicals you've been in the pit for? Uh, uh, chorus line and things like this, mm -hmm. sort of the more classical musical theater. Yeah, the, stand, the Broadway musical. Broadway musical. Have you seen Hamilton? I have not. Yeah. It is on my list of things to do. Have you heard the music? And I have. I have. It's it's awesome, is it not? It's it's a whole new genre of thing. It's very yeah. exciting. Yeah. Uh, I was reading that uh, uh, the star, the the writer of the show, is actually starting to work on a, on another one. Mm, so look yeah. forward to that. Um, uh, so, since you play in a pit orchestra, that means you have to practice. In theory, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I tell the conductor, yeah, I practice. Yeah. I yeah. got it. And, uh, yeah. and he believes you. So far, so good. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, we wish you all the best being in the pit and <laughs> all the best with your Legos and with your career. Right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I used to play the clarinet, so I, I understand the, the whole woodwind thing. Um, and then I decided not to practice and became uh, a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> Let me now uh, introduce and please welcome to the stage Nicole Leung from UC Santa Barbara. Nicole? <laughs> is essential for our health and survival, yet too many of us are not getting enough of it. The U.S. Institute of Medicine estimates that over 50 million Americans suffer from sleep deficiency, which increases the risk of depression, obesity, heart disease, and stroke. A disruption to sleep is a disruption to the body's internal clock, a clock deep within the brain that controls sleep-wake cycles and other daily patterns. A defining feature of the internal clock is its ability to synchronize to the surroundings, such as to light. For example, light is what allows us to adjust to new time zones when we travel. There are two questions that drive my research at the Craig Montel Lab at UCSB. First, how do our eyes receive light information? And second, how is this information converted into a language that our brains can understand? In the human eye, there are two pathways of light from the eye to the brain. Light through rods and cones allows for vision, and light through these lesser known retinal ganglion cells helps reset the internal clock. Interestingly, individuals who are blind can still sense light, and they do so through these cells to help maintain their internal clocks. However, there's still a lot we do not know about this second pathway. So the two light pathways in the human eye are drastically different. So different, in fact, that the second pathway is actually more similar to a pathway found in the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. I use the light pathway found in the fly eye as a model to study how light affects our internal clocks. Through my work, I discovered a new protein that is critical for the light pathway in the fly eye, which is shown in the top left. The image next to it is zoomed in to individual eye cells, and in green are proteins of the light pathway. 
here I show that this new protein in red is found in the same place. And I also show that this protein is important for proper eye function. To test this, I measured the electrical activity of the fly eye responding to flashes of light using the device shown on the left. And I found that when you knock out this critical protein, the fly eye can no longer communicate with the brain, which means that these flies, these mutant flies, are essentially blind. So why is it important to study the path of light from the eye to the brain? This fly protein is also present in humans. By manipulating this protein, we may one day be able to manually reset our internal clocks and find a cure for conditions like jet lag and other sleep disorders with the hope of helping us stay up longer and sleep better. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I think a lot of us can empathize with the sleep <laughs> deprivation part of, uh, of, the, of your presentation. Tell us about uh, your journey to UCSB. How'd you get there? Yeah, so actually, uh, I grew up in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. My family is still there, so hi, family. Um, hi. I, <laughs> um, I was there for 15 years, and then I went to boarding school in Connecticut. I mm -hmm. went to Choate Rosemary Hall. Mm -hmm. um, it was too cold for me, so mm -hmm. I moved. Uh, again, the weather theme is uh, <laughs> propping up. Uh, I moved to Los Angeles, and I attended Occidental College, mm -hmm. where President Obama uh, spent a couple years. So we're very, uh, we're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. And then I, after college, I moved up to UC Santa Barbara, and I worked as a lab technician for mm -hmm. a evolution lab, and I studied the evolution of bioluminescence. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started grad school in Craig Montal's lab studying sensory neurobiology. And that got you into the study of the eye and, and the research that you described here today. Exactly. Um, uh, tell us a, a little bit about yourself when you're not uh, studying. What do you like to do in your spare time? I am a dancer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let the record show. <laughs> All right. What kind of dance? Um, I trained in ballet since I was three. Mm -hmm. And due to a back injury when I was a teenager, I had to stop training. I guess I wanted to be a prima ballerina. That was my life dream. Yeah. Um, but then I found science, and now this is, this is my lifelong dream. But I still continue to dance, and I still take ballet classes at UCSB and other forms of dance as well. Do you ever get thrown up in the air? Uh, no, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, 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 at uh, Santa Barbara, uh, you're studying the eye. W yeah. Where do you see yourself in, say, five or six years, ten years? What are your goals? Um, I definitely um, very passionate about research. So whether I stay in academia or I uh, find a job in industry, I think. Uh, basic science research is going to be my priority. Mm -hmm. So that's where I see myself. And I, and I see myself in California for a very long time, maybe yeah. forever. All right, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, um, um, do you get enough sleep? No, I do not get enough sleep. <laughs> yeah, um, that is the honest truth. <laughs> I, I, what is enough sleep? I think that depends person to person. There is not, you know, everyone says, oh, it's eight hours or more. More sleep is not necessarily better. Uh, some people function very well with seven, six and a half. So mm -hmm. it really depends on the person. And it's more the quality of sleep you get rather than the quantity. Uh, so what do you mean by quality of sleep? I'm, try I'm trying to think of the meetings I've been in recently and whether, <laughs> um, whether I got to the right level. So yeah. <laughs> Um, so I believe that um, quality of sleep is really an undisturbed sleep. You know, if you live, uh, which where I live, I am in the direct flight path to the Santa Barbara Airport. Mm -hmm. So every couple hours, you know, there's a, you know, yeah, that is disruption in sleep. So I think quality sleep is undisturbed, deep sleep. Oh, then I've definitely been there. Okay. <laughs> Well, we wish you all the best. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, uh, we're now at contestant number nine. 
Uh, please give a warm welcome to Tiffany Taylor from UC San Diego. Every year, about 18,000 adults in America are diagnosed with a brain tumor called glioma. And almost the exact number of people die from this disease each year. Now, gliomas are extremely difficult to treat because of therapeutic resistance, or as I like to call it, the yo-yo effect, which means that when these tumors are hit with chemotherapy or radiation, they go away, but then they come back. They're hit again with an aggressive therapy, and they go away, but then they come back. And this cycle of tumor recovery continues until loss of life. Now, the goal of many therapies used against gliomas is to hit a single target to cause tumor death. But this approach is only effective temporarily because gliomas are mosaics of cells that can be genetically very different. So in response to a single target-based therapy, tumor recovery will also be very different. So there is a great need to extend the current treatment strategies to include more effective combination therapies that are specific to how gliomas recover. And so this is what my research in the Fanari lab at UCSD addresses. I, like a CIA agent gathering intel, have identified different ways that gliomas can recover from a single target-based therapy called anti-EGFR, where the target EGFR is commonly found in gliomas. And so using a tumor model in my lab that reproduces the yo-yo effect that I described earlier, treatment with anti-EGFR eliminates the EGFR expressing cells from the tumors, resulting in tumor shrinkage to almost nothing. But then after a period of time, these tumors recover. And so these returning tumors have different genetic profiles. And so I use these genetic differences to identify how they reemerged. And so what I found is that one way is through a new leader gene that can compensate for loss of EGFR and promote tumor growth. A second way involves a driver gene that promotes tumor growth as part of a team with some less dominant passenger genes. And in a third way, when no single gene could be identified as responsible, what was evident was a predominant tumor behavior that was established as the cause. So the ability to repair damage that was inflicted by treatment with anti-EGFR. And so these are only a few of the ways identified, but what I hope that you can appreciate is that now with this central intel on how gliomas recover, a clinician can then match the follow-up treatment to the individual tumors to more effectively kill these tumors. So that now the recovery we see are the people battling this disease every day. Thank you. Hold on just a minute. I forgot, yeah, what to, is it? I forgot the thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much and, and uh, for uh, that presentation, Tiffany. We'll get uh, close to the mic. And uh, we're all interested in knowing what your journey was to UC San Diego. Have you always been interested in science, for example? Uh, I have. I, I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, science was actually one of my favorite subjects because it was the only one that I didn't master. So it was like challenging. And so I was like, okay, I won't get bored with this, so let's stick with this. Um, and so I went to the East Coast to Howard University for undergrad mm -hmm. and did biology and there met a wonderful mentor, Ted Bremner. Hi, Ted. <laughs> He's watching. Um, who got me really interested in cancer biology. And so I did work in his lab. Um, and yeah, just wanted to pursue a graduate education in cancer biology. And what brought you to San Diego? So there was actually one professor who works at San Diego. She's not my current advisor, but when I was in a senior, I had this big plan that I was going to go to UCSD and I was going to work in Jean Yang's lab. Um, so I actually only applied to UCSD because she worked there. Uh -huh. But when I got there, she had six graduate students, so she couldn't take me, but she helped me to find my current mentor. And she's on my committee meetings, my thesis committee. So. I still get some help from her. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and and, and uh, when you're not doing cancer biology, what, what do you like to do in your spare time? 
uh, hang out with friends, but one of my favorite pastimes is to binge out on Korean dramas. I love <laughs> Korean dramas. They're so good. <laughs> Wait a minute. Binge on Korean dramas? Yes, yes. I don't yes. even. I have what, to what educate you guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. So, so what's people, a Korean drama? people think that they're like telenovela. So you can think of it as a telenovela. It's not as crazy. Well, some might be a little bit. <laughs> but they actually have a specific amount of episodes. So they don't go on and on and on. Most of them are about 16 episodes. So you start one, you watch the episodes, and you see how the story transpires, and then you get to the end. But my friends and I, we realized the pull is that every single episode ends on a cliffhanger, right? Oh. So then you're like, oh no, I have to see what happens next. And then there's also the pull of, I want to see what happens at the end. So you just keep watching and watching and watching. Uh -huh. So you get to the end. So the key is, if you have work to do, just don't start one. Because yeah. once you start, yeah. it's yeah. just spirals. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. so that could tie into sleep deprivation. Could it not? Oh yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. I. Uh, yeah, many nights yeah, where I <laughs> didn't, didn't get much sleep, and then I'd be in lab, and I was like, but it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you speak Korean? Chogumyo. Uh, that means a little. Yeah, a little? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm just in, uh, so how, how do you go from uh, New Orleans to Korean dramas? <laughs> uh, my best friend, hopefully she's watching. She's a biology teacher, so she spent one winter break at San Diego at school. All of us were gone. She went on Hulu looking for romantic comedies, typed it in, and then these Korean dramas came up. And so she got binged out on it. And so when I came back, she was like, you have to watch this with me. You have to. And I was like, uh, I don't know. Maybe. I'll watch one. Uh -huh. So we watched one episode. And then 16 episodes later. You're yeah, like, I watched like yeah. seven the first time. She wow. was like, oh, how did you like it? I was like, stop talking. Put the next one on. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how. Latira Haynes, you influenced me. <laughs> well, um, I think we are uh, almost to our last contestant, so we're on a, on a cliffhanger. <laughs> yes. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
and then you could swim faster. Same thing happens with aerosols. As they get warmer, they get more liquidy, allowing the molecules inside of them to move around faster, and thus change the color faster. Aerosols are vital to our understanding of climate change. We've paid a lot of attention to carbon dioxide over the last several decades. We need to pay just as much attention to these aerosols if we want to implement the most effective environmental policies. My work gets us one step closer and fills in one more piece of this climate change puzzle. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mallory. And, and now I, I have to contemplate swimming through peanut butter. So uh, it's that, a very interesting to think about. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Mallory, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey, please. Well, I knew that I wanted to do chemistry after high school, so I actually went to San Diego State and did my bachelor's degree and my master's degree there, and I actually studied silver nanoparticles. But I really wanted a way to directly impact the environment. So I knew UC Irvine has a really great atmospheric chemistry program, so that's where I wanted to go. I did apply other places, but... That was Luckily, the, I got that into UCI. The that's yeah, the one I wanted. That was the one. You wanted to be an anteater. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a teacher or somebody particular in high school or earlier that got you turned on to science? How did this happen? I had a really great high school chemistry teacher. His name was Mr. Schlonecker. Probably isn't watching this, but. <laughs> he could. Yeah. He could. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. possible. But he was really great, and he made it really interesting. Yeah. And so that's why I wanted to go into it. And then you've pursued it ever, ever, ever since. What do, you, what do you like to do in, in your time when you're not doing chemistry? I like to do a few things. I like uh, playing softball. So I have a really great, just fun softball team, not competitive. Does it have a name? <laughs> What's the name of your team? It's called the Blackhawks. The Blackhawks. I thought Hawks. that would be intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> I'm intimidated. And, uh, <laughs> what, and what position do you play? I play second. All right, second base. All right, so you play soft. What else do you like to do? I actually like to bake, which goes hand in hand with chemistry because you get to mix things together. And at, but at the end of baking, you actually get to eat the thing that you made. <laughs> chemistry, that's kind of frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to make cupcakes. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. now, did you bring any today? I didn't. <laughs> it would have taken me a very long time to make enough cupcakes for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> do you like to dance? I do like to dance, but I don't have any formal training, so I don't know if I can keep up with all of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think so. Maybe uh, Arturo can teach you. I'll take you up on that. <laughs> Fellow anteater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As I said earlier, the dancing part of the program will commence after we do the presentation. So, We're already planning. Uh, that, that, that's really good. Where do you see your future? Where, where do you see yourself in five to ten years? I actually really like uh, environmental chemistry, so I want to go into science policy so I can help implement these public policies that these aerosols are important for. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping to go do a science and technology fellowship from AAAS when I'm done mm -hmm. with grad school. Oh, very good, very good. Are you following the Paris Accord and the uh, agreement that is being signed in the United Nations today on climate change? Not, not today. <laughs> I've got other things on my mind. you were kind of busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems like the world is finally beginning to engage in, in, in yeah, it's really exciting. Be a, a role for scientists. Um, and do you see yourself staying in California? I am born in California, and so, but a lot of the science policy is in Washington, D.C., so it may be that I have to go that direction. Maybe we can get Washington, D.C. to come out to California. That would be a great idea. I would love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. They might be able to actually do something. Um, I'm actually very scared of the winters in, uh, I've never actually had winter. Uh, so this is, a, yeah. that would be a very intense thing for me. <laughs> well, it's worth experimenting with every now yeah. and then. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Let's give a round to everybody. That was awesome. All right, our judges are tabulating their results. I'm going to turn the, the podium over to Bill Tucker, uh, our interim vice president for uh, research, and he'll tell us what to do next. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to ask Janet to join me on stage here as we uh, make the presentation on to the awards. Um, we'll announce third place, uh, second place, and then the grand prize winner who will receive the Slammy. Um, <laughs> All, uh, yeah, all the presenters were, were wonderful and impressive, and I know it must have been really difficult work for the judges.
but uh, uh, here we go. And the third place winner is Gary Lee from UCLA. The second place goes to Mallory Hinks from UC Irvine. So wow, this is really exciting. Uh, so uh, now it's time to name our winner. Uh, I have no idea who it is, and I tried to find out a little earlier, and you would have thought I was asking to crack an iPhone. Uh, so n no cooperation, unfortunately. So I, I should take this moment to let everyone know that while we hope you enjoyed yourself today, uh, we take this portion of the program very seriously. The judges' scores have been very carefully tabulated and the results have been kept very secure and very protected. <laughs> yeah, we're talking, we're talking high-level special ops security around here and I think the president probably understands this very well. Um, so uh, this is not more level security. Uh, uh, we are the not so secret agents because where you see and we keep everything public and open. So, <laughs> uh, so now that uh, I've got my security clearance, I uh, am being presented with the envelope, uh, which I assume has the name of our winner in it. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me do the honors here. And the slammy goes to Peter Barley from UC Riverside. And as this is the, sec the second annual uh, Grad Slam, we have, uh, we have now had the pressure of, pr pr pleasure of presenting the uh, perpetual Grad Slam tr Slamming Trophy to the, the, the Dean of the school with the winner. So this is for, uh, for Joe, Joe Childers. We'll ask Peter, Peter to come up too. Great. So thank you all. Uh, on behalf of President Napolitano and all of us at the Office of the President, we really want to thank, thank our wonderful partners at LinkedIn and, and the Bay Area Council for for helping to make this day so successful. Uh, it's been a wonderful day. I think every, I can see the smile on everyone's faces, so that means we've, been, we've done the right thing. Uh, we appreciate all the work done by so many people to make this happen. Uh, there's far too many people to name. Uh, certainly, a huge number of people working at the Office of the President from academic affairs and beyond have been involved in planning this. Um, I really want to compliment Pamela and her team from Graduate Studies. <laughs> 
as, as well as the, Nicole and the, and the folks at LinkedIn who've sort of teamed up on this for a while and uh, really made it happen. So I, th I want to appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate all the work that everyone's done. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, it's been a great event. I want to thank each of you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your support, uh, the great energy on behalf of graduate education. Uh, as you leave, we have a, a small token gift for you. Uh, please be sure to pick up your uh, Grad Slam mug as you exit. Thank you, and we'll see you all next year. And uh, yeah, continue to support the University of California and, and its amazing role as a, a, an education engine and a workforce development engine in California. Thank you very much. Thank you.